I never knew you had peace until Jesus entered my life. You know, I don't know about you, but I had no peace. You know, everything about me was rushing and trying to satisfy myself and trying to find out why I belong and why I'm here. And then Jesus came into my life and everything changed. Peace for the very first time in my life. And I don't know about you, but without Jesus, there's no such thing as peace. Mankind's been trying to have peace since the beginning of time, and they've done a pretty good job killing each other. No peace. There's a day coming when there's going to be peace. And I look forward to that day. But you know what's neat? Right now, in, in the chaos of this world, we're in Christ, we can have peace. And we have it every day. Father, I just pray in Jesus' name now as we have the wonderful opportunity to open your word and, and just literally receiving from you. And I just pray as we sit at your feet this morning that you would teach us, Lord, that I could be your mouthpiece, your vessel, that you would use me. But Lord, would you allow your spirit to come and open every heart and every mind to the truth of your word. And Lord, not only open our heart and our mind to the truth of your word, but Lord, would you allow us and help us to take steps towards living in the truth of your word. That we begin to walk out our faith. That others might see the reality of Jesus in us. Lord, uh, have your way this morning. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 I got to turn some more lights on. I don't like all those lights on either. You can get those, Jerry, over here. Oh, I'll that. Thank you. As I get older, my eyes need a little more light. <laughs> We've been in uh, Romans chapter 12, because we've been in the gospel. Does that make any sense yet? No. The reason we went there is because as we were looking at Jesus saying that he's, he is the Lord of the Sabbath, and then we talked through all that, that he's a priest in the order of Melchizedek forever. He reigns, and there's no other need for a priesthood. And Jesus intercedes for us on all occasions. But in Peter, verse 2, 1 Peter, it says that we're royal priests. And so we've been talking about this idea, what does it look like for us to be royal priests? Because it's not the same priesthood, if we look in the Old Testament, as of the priesthood today. In the Old Testament, there was a royal priest once a year who went into the Holy of Holies. But now that Jesus died, he what? He ripped open the curtain, so the way to the Holy of Holies is open for all of us. So every day of every moment, we have full access to God. So... We've been talking about our role as a royal priest is the fact that we're ambassadors for Christ. As it says in Corinthians, that we represent Christ. We take the message and the authority and the power of God everywhere we go. Just like an ambassador for the U.S. would go to another country. And he represents the full authority and power and the presence of the United States. But we have not, I think we've lost that as a church, understanding that literally, because you're a child of God, that you're no longer a child of the darkness, that you've been redeemed and rescued from darkness and brought into the light, and you're called children of light. Now it says in Matthew 5, 16, what? Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And I, I like saying it a little bit different, but let your light shine. Let the love of Jesus shine through you in such a way that people want the Jesus that you're modeling. And so, being an ambassador, we learned that we're carrying the message of reconciliation, the good news of the gospel, all that Jesus did for us on the cross. That he paid the full price for your sin and my sin. That he didn't only die for our sin, but he fulfilled the law and all the righteous requirements of the law on our behalf. Because without it, we still have to give an account for everywhere we went wrong, right? Remember the law, sole purpose, according to Romans, is to be a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. But then the question came, is how do we get out from underneath that law? And it tells us in Romans, what? It says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? But the sole purpose here is what he's talking about. The law has pointed out everywhere you're guilty. There's no mercy. There's no grace. There's no redemption in the law. The law just says you're guilty. But it goes on and says what? that we've been baptized into Christ Jesus' death, that in order, just as Christ was buried through baptism and raised to life, that we too may be raised to live a new life. So, the Romans 7 teaches us the only way out from underneath the law is to die. So, when we become born-again believers, 
Baptism is a symbol. Now, baptism didn't save you. It's a symbol of what already has taken place. You're proclaiming the, to the world the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, but at the same time, you're also, what? Being buried with Christ and raised with Christ to live a new life. We've, we've died. So we're no longer under the old covenant at all. It's finished. So, but the law is good. It's perfect. It's holy. It's still working today because it's still doing what? For those who don't understand or know Jesus, the law says you're guilty. Sole purpose. Then they have to, there's only one way to be redeemed. Through Jesus. So in light of that, the key verse in this whole section, two verses, is verses 1 and 2 of Romans 12, right? Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, what we're talking about, can you imagine? Just, just for a moment, take a moment to imagine standing before God Almighty, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Can you imagine? It says that he literally, the word separates between soul and spirit, joint and marrow, judges the thoughts and intentions. There's no escaping. Can you imagine, just for a moment, what that would be like without Jesus paying the price? You'll never understand the mercy until you understand your guilt. You'll never love Jesus the way you should love Jesus until you understand the fullness of what he's done. It's finished. You can't add to it or take it away from it. He completely finished it. Now our part is what it's saying here, right? Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, what? To offer your bodies, to offer yourself as living sacrifices to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. And I just love this. It's literally every day saying, Lord, use me. Lord, I'm yours. So taking up your cross daily and following him has to do with taking Jesus everywhere you go. Doesn't matter where you're at. The grocery store, pickleball, golf, I don't care what you're doing, playing cards, whatever you might be doing, driving your golf cart. I don't care what you're doing, getting gas, eating in a restaurant. We're taking Jesus with us. If you're in Christ. And the idea is that in those places, your light will shine in such a way. You'll see that the love of Jesus that you have is real. And people begin to want to know that or be offended by it. It goes both ways, right? So it goes on here. It says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Anybody need any of that? The world is constantly pressing in. I mean, one of the things we talked about is if we would really honestly get before God and spend the week just saying, okay, Lord, show me where I conform. That's scary. Because some things he's going to show me, my body. Right? So offering yourself as a living sacrifice, and that's that moment where you come back and say, okay, Lord, I, here it is. Sometimes it's attached to a great big rubber band and comes back. <laughs> you have to keep doing it until you finally let go, right? So, when I look at this, the only way we don't conform, and we were talking, we spent quite a bit of time talking through the, the function of the body of Christ and all the different things that we have and the gifts that he gives, but it's only together that we make a whole. It's together we're living stones built upon another, which is the temple of God. The right that we're individual lights and temples, but man, there's so much power, and when we gather like this, and we're living stones built upon Christ, the cornerstone, and the prophets, and the apostles, and us. And this is where God chooses to dwell now, in us, through us. That's exciting. So we spent quite a bit of time going through those verses, but down here, in verse 9, where we were last week, the key verse here is, love must be sincere. We talked about a lot of things, but as we get going this morning, love must be sincere. And what I found in my life is if I don't understand the mercy of God, my love is artificial. I'm just trying to be good. I'm trying to do the right thing. I spent some years early on trying so hard to be good. I've never been more frustrated in my whole life. It wasn't until I realized my flesh is never going to be good and this is truly an enemy and I started to treat it as such that I started to live in freedom. <coughs> when I say flesh, I'm not talking to this. I'm talking about flesh and thoughts, attitudes, me, 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 that we're all raised in in the world. I love 
First John 2, 15 and 16 says, Do not love the world, or what? Or anything in the world. For everything in the world, the craving of the simple man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does, come not from the Father, but from the world, which is the spirit of the world. Ephesians 2, 1 says, All of us at one time followed the prince of the power of the earth. The hardest part of that deal is it started when we were born. We've been dancing on things for a long time. I got a new dance party. <coughs> Praise God. He didn't leave us to ourselves to try to work us out. He sent the precious Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, to work in us. Because now we're called temples. Don't you know? If you yourselves are God's temple, the Spirit lives in you. So love must be sincere. And I tied that in with 1 Corinthians 13, 1, where it really goes through all this stuff. You know, I offer my body to the flames and I don't have love. I'm all, you know, when I read through that, it's all the great things that you would want to do, right? Give all your money to the poor, do all these things. But if I have not love, it's only what? The noisy gong. You made a little noise, but that's all it was. It was all about you. There's a lot of people in the world doing great things, but it's really about them. It's not bringing glory to Jesus. You know the difference is? Who you put your focus on when you're doing it. And why are you doing it? It's like Ananias Friday, right? In Acts chapter 5, they saw everybody selling extra lands and properties and homes and, and bringing all the proceeds and land for the, the, the apostles because there was a great need because people were from all over and they weren't at home and they were taking care of those needs. I mean, this is an awesome picture of the church. And Ananias went to Friday and said, let's sell these properties. Let's keep some of it. They're just telling me they didn't do all. Right? Because we want to be recognized as one of those. I mean, look at it. What happened? God said, uh uh, no lie, God, the Holy Spirit. That was on the New Testament side. How's that make you feel? Don't mess with God in that way. You know, don't lie. But I, I'm looking in here and it says, hate what is evil. And we talk through that, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. And, and this is the one that we kind of talk about quite a bit. Honor one another above yourselves and how hard that really is. I mean, it's one thing to try to honor people as the same as you, but it's really saying put others first. Now, you can do that in a false humility way too, right? It's, it's amazing pride and all those things that are involved in all these things. And, and as we, have, we still have this flesh that isn't going to be done away with until we meet Jesus face to face. And Galatians tells us in chapter 5 that they're in conflict with one another, and we can put to death the misdeeds of our flesh. How? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. So if you're like me, tell me if you haven't been in the middle of something and if you ever get that little prick in your heart. Oh, yeah, right? You're not being sincere. Man, I do. And I have to rewind and adjust and talk to the Lord and come back and try that again. You know, because I... The flesh isn't going away. And, and learning to distinguish between when it's your flesh and when it's the Spirit of God, that's the key to all of life for us. Learning to keep in step with the Spirit, be continuously filled with the Spirit. It's only then that I can love right. It's only then that I'll praise the Lord right. I mean, in the sense of understanding His mercy, right? So it goes on in here, and where I want to get, and it says these things. It says, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Now, what does it mean by never be lacking in zeal? I mean, you'd be zealous, you know, on all these things. But I wrote down a definition, I just thought it was interesting. It means dedication or enthusiasm, devotion, and you're motivated. By what? You're motivated by what His mercy has done for you. Right? How many churches have you sat in? I mean, if we're really honest, <coughs> and you walk away and go, whew, I'm glad that's over. I mean, just be honest. I'm just saying. What's happening is we're going through the motions of church so often without even really having the presence of Jesus among us. With no real enthusiasm, no real joy in the midst of that. And then it goes on here when it said, you know, it says this, it says, but keeping your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. And I love this, the, the definition I wrote inside of my Bible says, Spirit of fervor has to do with evidence of faith that is alive. You ever wonder why some people don't want what you have? 
I've had some people say, I, I've told them, I've literally said, man, don't, don't share with people until something real happens in your life. Because if this is what you call Christianity, I, I absolutely don't want anything to do with it. People can see and read us. We're like an open book that people are just reading. Watch it. If you're in Christ, you're alike. People are paying attention. You tell people you go to church, and well, I always love this, and I just drive them crazy. But most people, they don't say I'm a follower of Jesus, they say, well, I'm a Baptist. <laughs> I'm a Christian missionary alliance dude. And I'm like, ooh. Simply God. I go to the Methodist church down the street, and I say, how's that going? It doesn't matter what movement you say you're from. That's not the point. You missed it. Because you go there, it doesn't make you safe. That might make it worse for you if you don't enter in. You haven't really entered in. But it goes on in this definition, and I love it. It says, evidence of your faith is alive, vibrant, effervescent. The idea is you have a whole expectation of experiencing God today. Did you come in the door today with that thought? You have a holy expectation that the Lord is going to meet you personally today. You have a holy expectation when you get up in the morning and sit down to your cup of coffee and the Bible. I can't have a fool without the coffee. I'm not awake yet. Right? Have my coffee with the Lord. I love that time. But every single time I come, I have an expectation. I'm not just sitting there by myself. <coughs> Cam King is in the room with me. He's speaking to me. He's moving in my life. Now do I go all, no, I don't think that's the same in there. Do I have an unbelievable expectation in my heart that God wants to do something to me today? Yes. That he wants to meet with me, that he has a divine appointment for me. So when you look at all that stuff, my question for all of us, how are you doing when I speak about that? What, what's going on in your heart when you hear those terms and those words? Are you alive in your faith? When people who don't know you see you go, There's something different about it. Why is that person so happy? Something's different. And you know me, I work out in the gym and do all those kind of things. I don't tell people I'm a pastor and all that. But usually after three or four months, somebody will say, What do you do? <laughs> And guess what happens? At some point, I go, Can't take it anymore! 
Anybody ever had that experience? <laughs> I'm not the only one that feel better. <laughs> but what I've learned is, you know, I always wrestled with forever. What does it mean to keep in step with the Spirit? What does it mean to be continuously filled with the Spirit? What does it look like to be a Spirit-filled person, you know, a, a believer? And all these kind of things, because I, I was realizing real quick this Christian thing, trying to live out this Christian life, was really hard. Because they're just enough. Because just think about it. Have you ever, I know you've never done this, but have you ever seen somebody kind of slip up in one area and go, man, dude, get it together. Right? Because it wasn't the thing that really trips you up. And before the day's over, the thing that trips you up hits you right in the face. <clears throat> it's so funny how we're, we're, these human beings that we are, man, we are messed up sometimes when it comes to these kind of things. We just don't. But what I learned is every day, this idea of offering ourselves as a living sacrifice, do you realize that's an everyday, sometimes moment by moment thing? Not a one that's once and done. Because you're in a relationship with God. You're in a relationship with the King of the universe. He says He made His home in us, the Father and the Son, through the Spirit. Greater is He who lives in us than He is in the world. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So that, those scriptures start being more to me. When I realized it wasn't so I could bench 400 pounds. Because like, we use them that way. And I'm just like, man, you can care less about bench 400 pounds. You care a whole lot what I'm like when I'm there. If I really have his love and his heart. And do I see people with his eyes? Do I touch those who need touch? Do I spend time with those who everybody's rejecting? Do I do the things that make the difference in somebody else's life that they can actually see the reality that this Jesus is for them, not against them. It's a big deal. And so every morning I've been learning, and you hear me say this often, but I say this, I say, Lord, I joyfully and willfully submit everything that I am to you. I want to be under your hand. I want the Spirit of God to lead my steps to me. I want you to hold my eyes to see the needs of those around me that I might respond. I have days when I'm self-centered and I don't want to see anything. Because I want to get what I'm doing done. You ever have that where you're right in the middle of something and somebody really needs you? And, and you, if you're like me, it's kind of like, <gasps> okay, you know, okay, I'm going to do this. And afterwards, you're always so glad you did because the Lord meets you in that. But in the middle of it, I am so driven. I get my eyes on something, I want to finish it, right? But God's always interrupting me. And you know one of the things I learned if you study the life of Christ, how many times do you get, up, get interrupted in the middle of being on the mount praying? And he never got to me. I thought, wow, I've got a long ways to go. But the good news is the one in us, the Spirit of the living God, produces a fruit that begins to naturally flow out of us instead of something we're straining to make happen. There's a constant yielding. Okay, Lord, well, you know I'm going to blow. I, I'm just this honest. I'm going to blow this right now if you don't come and help me. And it's so amazing when God comes and all of a sudden you walk through something and it's grace. There's nothing like it. And then you walk away and say, Lord, I want more of you. I want more of that. I want to know what it is to keep in step with the Spirit of God. Please renew my mind. It goes on in here. It says, Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. I mean, these are tough things. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud. We get a bunch of do nots now. And then it goes on down here. It says, do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Isn't that something um, with men especially that I do leaders and training with a lot? Uh, anger, lust, and pride are the three big things. We deal with all of them. They're all connected to because all of us have. But it's amazing how you think you're dealing with pride in one level, and then the Lord will reveal another level. I, I just love it. God just, you ever notice when you're dealing with something that that thing will just keep coming back until you actually really deal with it? It's one thing to say, oh God, I'm sorry, I blew it. And the Lord says, okay, you're forgiven. But let's try that again. My prayer is, God, please help me learn quickly. Not finding too much for anymore. I really want to learn. I really do want to walk in a way that pleases him. But the truth is, these are hard things. And it's a miracle when it happens right because we're actually building our lives. Isn't that cool, though? God's grace and his patience. He's telling us to have patience. Do you realize his patience is 
perfect. He doesn't all of a sudden just run out. That's always was my fear when I first started walking the floor. He's going to probably get so mad at me. You know? But he didn't. He didn't. But it goes on here, and it says, Do not repay evil, anyone evil for evil. Well, that's against everything we watch on TV. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you. And I love it that he put that in there, as far as it depends on you. Remember when we talked about those irregular people in our lives that just kind of create you? They're just a certain personality that you'd rather smack them than talk to them, you know? I mean, just be honest. But we don't. We don't do it. We restrain ourselves, right? But the truth of the matter is, God brings those people in our life because that's where sanctification really takes place. He's trying to knock off those rough edges in my life. That love is sincere. See? But he goes on here. He says, do not take re revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to advance, I will repay, says the Lord. So, delaying revenge is not easy. Is it? Now, I'm kind of a, you know, I, I worked in the factories and construction, but all those things, and I was kind of a, sometimes a practical joker. Anybody else? Um, always doing something funny, if you think it's funny. Or somebody does something to you, and, and my, my old saying was, I don't get even, I get ahead. I just, I mean, because if you're not careful, that rolls over into everything, right? And that's the things that God's been teaching me, how hard it really is to humble yourself and to say, Lord, one of the things I did at camp, I ran youth camps for 11 years, and you can just imagine all the practical joking that goes on there, right? So I would participate some, you know, they took my underwear and froze it, and took up the flight and pulled it. <laughs> all sorts of crazy things, you know, and you're just like, God, you kidding me? You know, it's not like there's a laundry thing there, you know, so I'd ride to Kmart and buy new underwear. But anyway, so what do I do? I pack up all their stuff, because I'm the guy in charge of everything. When they're out with all the kids, I go in and get all the girls' stuff, and pack it in my car and drive it somewhere about three miles down the road and get walk back. <laughs> After that year, the Lord spoke to me. <laughs> when I had a bunch of crying counselors, I figured I'd better not do this anymore. <laughs> but what he really spoke to me is just don't do that. If they do it, that's fine. You know, and I just started changing. So it wasn't any fun anymore because they do stuff to me and I didn't do anything back. But I realized this thing didn't help me. Because I didn't want to be outdone. So I did something bigger. You know, it's just <laughs> These things are not easy, but you know, it says leave room for God's wrath. And you know, can I just say, the longer I've been in the Lord, the more, if you're not careful, you can read that and go, Lord, I pray that you, you give them what they deserve. <laughs> Anybody ever said that? <laughs> I know you don't want to admit it. But the truth of the matter is, I've learned no matter how hideous something is, do I pray they pay for their crime? Absolutely. But do I pray for their soul? Yes, I do. That's what it means to hate what is evil. I can hate what was evil in my the love of person. Because that soul, I mean, think about what happens when you get born again. You get born again. You get it? You become a new person in Christ. And I can't imagine somebody's been in turning now that hasn't chose to repent and turn to Jesus. Isn't it good to know that he died for all sins? We want to rank those sins because ours aren't quite as bad. We think. <laughs> There's just no such thing. It's all level ground at the cross. And God can save anything. Think of Saul who became Paul. I mean, over 2,000 people were martyred during his reign of terror on the church trying to kill him. And the Lord chose him. He became the most prolific New Testament writer for us where we get our instructions. And in fact, this is from him. But he goes on here and it says this. I'm going to wrap this up. It says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. Just all jumping up and down. He is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. It has a lot to do with the idea that they're going to see that light that we talked about earlier. The reality that what you actually say is matching what you are actually doing, even though they deserve worse. And I've had that happen. I've had guys say to me, man, I deserve more. Where do you go to church? And I'm like, what? Over here. Next thing you know, they go and they get saved. Can I just say that I've never been perfect at this. But I want to be a person who errs in grace. I want to be a person that shows mercy because I've been so 
and mercy. I love what it ends with here. It says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's, that's another one of those verses that's easy to read. It's another whole thing when you live it out. We are, we're in a culture today where anger is what's ruling. Suspicion, slander, hatred is ruling. And I'm just telling you, the song that we sang, you know, the whole issue of love. I can't love good enough without Jesus really doing it in me. So I'm going to challenge this this morning in just this one way. Would you just stand with me as I finish? Maybe you do this with me. This is your heart. Would you just say this prayer with me? In the name of Jesus. Lord, I offer myself as that living sacrifice. Because of your mercy, that you've lavished on me. Thank you, Lord, for not giving up on me. So I pray, in the name of Jesus, that you might use me to bring love, the love of Christ, instead of hate and anger. So, Lord, I'm going to need a miracle. I'm going to need you to really show up in my life. Because I want you. I need more. In God's mighty name. Jesus, we love you. God, God's people said. Amen. Lord bless you.